Today we are in Genesis 4, and we see Adam and Eve coming out of the Garden of Eden. They've just been expelled from the Garden of Eden. And now we see Adam and Eve um, fulfilling the mandate that God had given them in the Garden of Eden to fill the earth and subdue it. They're having their, I don't know if it's their first child or not. I've read several commentaries, and some of them say that um, Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve's first children. Others don't know for sure because in the chapter of Genesis 4, when God puts the mark on Cain, um, he puts the mark on Cain so no one would kill him. And so um, even though from the first reading it looks like Cain and Abel were maybe their first children, um, I'm not so sure that that was the case. But either way, um, there's a lesson for us to learn in here from all of this. We see that... Um, the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden has been passed down to their children. And we'll see that in the sibling rivalry that occurs because of um, Cain's disobedience to the Lord in bringing the sacrifice. We also see in this chapter that um, somewhere along the way, Cain and Abel were told the importance of the kind of sacrifice and the hard attitude needed to bring the sacrifice to the Lord. Um, and... One of the commentaries I was reading said that it might have been when God clothed Adam and Eve with the skins in the garden that it was at that time he maybe revealed to them the importance of the shedding of blood in the sacrifice. But we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go through this chapter. So as we read this account of Cain and Abel, we see the importance of knowing God's will and of following in his way, doing what he tells us to do exactly the way he's told us to do it, and the importance of just listening and obeying the Lord. Cain's name means acquired and reminds us that life comes from God. And Abel means breath and tells us that life is brief. Eve says here, I mean, you know, we we're told in Genesis 3 that Eve would be the mother of all living. And here in Genesis 4, it says, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And then Eve says, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And so even if you think about childbirth, having children is a miracle of the Lord. Without the help of the Lord, we wouldn't be able to have children. And our children are a gift from the Lord. And she acknowledged that and realized that here. Genesis 2, 4, 2 through 6 is in the process of time. And this allows for a considerable increase in the world's population where it says in the process of time, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And it doesn't tell us exactly how many years, but we know that some time had passed, years had passed by. And so the world's population could continue to increase here. Um, there must have been a time where Cain and Abel, we already talked about that. So Cain rejected this revelation and came with a bloodless offering. There's also some different um, thoughts on the offerings that Cain and Abel brought. We see that um, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of, the flock, of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. So the, the problem here is one of them brought a sacrifice that pleased the Lord. He had a heart that pleased the Lord, and that would be Abel. Cain brought a sacrifice that did not please the Lord, and his heart was not right before the Lord. And we'll see that because of the anger that he had when God confronted him. What was wrong with the sacrifice that Cain brought? Well, one of the things we see here is that Cain just brought some of the fruits of his um, soil, some of the fruits of the soil, he didn't bring the first or the best. And God requires us, he wants the first and best of all that we have because he is worthy of our best. And here we see that Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Abel gave the best of what he had and brought it to the Lord. Some people say that the reason Cain's... Um, sacrifice was not accepted by the Lord is because it didn't require a blood sacrifice but there's also in the book of Moses in the law there were um, there was a law that said that if you brought anything 
to the Lord, and it was your first fruit, that that would be an acceptable offering to the Lord. And so Cain worked the soil, and he, he could have brought the very best of what he had, and he could have had a different attitude, and the Lord would still have accepted it, even though it was not a blood sacrifice at this time. So either way you look at it, and the most important thing I guess we're looking here would be the heart attitude of how they brought these sacrifices to the Lord. Because they both have merit in, in what we're, they said here in the different commentaries I read. You know, Adam surely taught his sons that work was from the Lord. And that it is the will of God for us to do everything we do as unto the Lord. As Christians, our work should be done in such a way that our light, our light shines before men and they see our Father in heaven because of our hard work. Whatever we, do, whatever we do, whether in word or deed, we're to do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus and for his glory. When God clothed Adam and Eve with the garments of skin, he taught them the importance of the blood sacrifice. So here we see that part. He passed this truth down to them. What were the reasons for the Lord's reactions? And, and that's what I was just kind of going over with you. But it says, all of the Old Testament shows us, points to the shedding of blood being required for the forgiveness of sins. We see the Old Testament sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats. Um, but we're also told that the shedding of blood in bulls and goats, the shedding of their blood, does not bring forgiveness. And so all of this is pointing to the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. These are all a shadow of what is to come. Verses, on shedding, verses that shed more light and the account of Cain and Abel would be 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. The Lord looks at the heart of man. So the Lord was looking at Cain and Abel's heart, and in Abel's heart, he saw a heart that wanted to please him and to bring his very best to the Lord. He didn't see that in Cain's heart. And what was more important to the Lord was not so much his sacrifice or his offering, but what was in his heart. You know, it's not um, our sacrifices, but our obedience that brings glory and honor to the Lord. It's not our outward appearance, our outward show of even religion that honors and pleases the Lord, but it's our heart attitude and desire to please Him with the things that we're doing more than the things we're doing bringing Him honor. It's our heart. Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8 says that our heart attitude is what the Lord is looking at. Hebrews 11, 4 and 6 says that Abel offered his sacrifice by faith that God would reward his obedience. So Abel offered his sacrifice to the Lord by faith, knowing that God would do what he said he would do in his life. The most important thing is that in any act of worship, we must have a heart desiring to please God. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. So our worship to the Lord is giving our lives completely to Him and living a life that is holy and pleasing and acceptable to Him. That honors Him more than anything. And once again, it requires a heart that desires to walk in obedience to Him, that desires to please Him and bring Him glory. We are to give our utmost for His highest, our best for Him, because He is worthy of our all. He wants us to consecrate our lives wholly unto Him. So that his name and renown will be seen in our lives. And may that be the desire of our hearts. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, I wait for you. Your name and renown is the desire of my heart. And may that be our heart's desire. When that's our heart's desire, the sacrifices and praises we bring to the Lord will honor him and please him. Many times we don't give the Lord our best because of our lack of confidence and trust in him. We don't truly believe he would do what he says he will do. If we step out in obedience, when our hearts are telling us this makes no sense, we will see the presence and power of the Lord come through and work in our lives. When Peter and the other fishermen were told to let down their nets in, in um, Luke, the Lord told them to go back out there. He said, go back out there and cast your net. Put it back down in that water. And Peter and the fishermen thought, why would we do that? We've been fishing all night and we hadn't caught a thing in this same water. Why should we do that? And then he said, Because you say so, Lord, I will. And I have that underlined in my Bible. Because the Lord says so, I will. And because the Lord said so, and they did, that net was full of fish, more than they could handle. 
And we've got to know that even though maybe the Lord said so, and they put down that net and they caught that bunch of fish, but even though sometimes we may not catch that bunch of fish when we do what the Lord tells us to, we can know that in His perfect time and way, He will do what He says He's going to do. The verse in Isaiah says, Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, I wait for you. Your name and renown are the desire of my heart. So when his name and renown are the desire of my heart, I'm going to walk in obedience to him and do what he tells me to do, even if it might not make sense at the time. I will trust him and lean not on my own understanding. Because he says so, I will. Can you say that? Cain's reaction to the Lord's disapproval was that he was very angry and his face was downcast. When the Lord came to Cain, instead of repenting and turning from his sin and his bad attitude, Cain got angry at the Lord. And in prophecy it tells us that a man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. And we see this in Cain's life. You know, he did wrong. And the Lord confronted him, giving him an opportunity to repent, confess his sin. But instead of repenting and confessing, he got angry at God. And his face was downcast. You know, he who conceals his sin does not prosper, but he who confesses them and renounces them finds mercy. And that's what the Lord is always coming to us, giving us an opportunity to confess our sins and to renounce them and turn to him so that he can pour his mercy upon us. He gives us opportunities to do that, and we can either choose to repent and turn back to him, or we can turn away from him in anger and rebellion with a hard heart. The Lord is continuing to pursue Cain in his rebellion, giving him a chance to repent. But because of his stubbornness, Cain continued to harden his heart. And this anger manifested, this anger in his heart manifested into murder of his brother. In Ephesians 4, 26 through 27, we see that when we harbor bitter feelings and anger in our hearts, it gives Satan a foothold in our lives. It not only affects us, but it affects everyone around us. It defiles everyone in our lives. An, un an unforgiving spirit hinders worship and destroys our fellowship with God and God's people. It is God's will that we get right with one another, forgiving as he has forgiven us and loving as he has loved us. Ephesians 4.28 tells us to get rid of all bitterness, anger, rage, brawling, and slander. And er along with every form of malice. Psalm 37 8 says, tells us to refrain from anger and turn from wrath because it leads only to evil. Proverbs 14, 17 8 says, tells us that we, we do foolish things when we are angry. A man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Proverbs 29 11 tells us that a fool gives full vent to his rage. And just as God gave Adam a chance to confess and repent, we see him doing the same thing to Cain. And asking him, where is your brother Abel? Cain shed innocent blood as an expression of continuing rebellion. This is the first time there is a record of man's blood being shed by his kinsman, his own brother. 1 John 3, 12 tells us that Cain belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. The Lord goes on to tell us that in this way the world will also hate us as we walk in the ways of the Lord, because they don't want to be exposed to the light of the Lord through our lives. And so it brings a hatred because of their rebellion against the Lord and His ways. So instead of repenting with shame and sorrow when God confronted him with the question, Where is your brother? He lied and became angry. God, in His mercy, delayed Cain's death, perhaps to give him further opportunity to repent. Though Abel is dead, he still witnesses to us that the life that counts is the life of faith. He gave his offering, his sacrifice to the Lord in faith. And that's what pleased the Lord. Cain's punishment was to be a constant reminder of what he had done. He was put under a curse and driven from the ground. When he worked the ground, it would no longer yield its crops for him. He would be a restless wanderer on earth. Cain then went out from the Lord's presence, which probably was the worst of his sentence. He was once again expelled from the presence of the Lord. Adam and Eve were put out of the garden. And they no longer had that close, intimate fellowship with the Lord because of their sin. Because sin separates us from God. And so here we see Cain also being separated from the presence of God. And not only 
He was separated from human society. When the Lord came to Cain and tried to confront him and told him to um, do the right thing, you know, in, in verse 6, is the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And then Cain went on and did what he was going to, in his mind, had decided to do. He was going to kill his brother Abel because God was pleased with Abel's offering, but Cain wasn't. So there was a resentment in Cain's heart, an anger in Cain's heart that led to murder. So when the Lord gave Cain his consequences of what was going to happen because of his sin and his murder of his brother, Cain was more worried about how this punishment was going to affect him than he was in being right with God. He had a worldly sorrow. He was full of himself and self-pity. He did not acknowledge his sin or seek forgiveness. Worldly sorrow is a form of sorrow that is just sorry we got caught, but there's no repentance or seeking forgiveness in it. A godly sorrow acknowledges that we have sinned against God, that we have grieved the heart of our Father. And godly sorrow leads to repentance and a changed life, a changed attitude. And if it's not a godly sorrow and our lives are continuing on the path that we started on just because we say we're sorry, it doesn't mean anything if we continue doing it over and over and over again. The Lord is looking for a godly sorrow, not a worldly sorrow that people have sometimes when they just get caught. They're sorry they get caught and they're sorry for the consequences it brings into their life because all sin has negative consequences. There are always consequences to our sin, but God can work even those consequences for our good in his lives. In, in our lives. He can work those consequences out for good in our lives if we let him. He can work everything out, even our sin and our failure, in conformity with the purpose of his will. And that's what he's doing. He's working behind the scenes of our life to accomplish his plan, even when we can't see it or understand it. When our consequences make us see our sin for what it is and cause us to repent, God is glorified and honored in our lives. In spite of the consequences, Cain still did not repent. He was thinking only of himself and that he too might be killed. Again, God shows his grace and mercy by putting a mark on Cain so that if anyone saw that mark, they would not kill him. Whatever that mark was, we don't really know. It showed everyone that vengeance belonged to the Lord alone. And it also proved God's faithfulness and mercy to sinful man. In his mercy, God doesn't give us what we deserve. And in his grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. God spared Cain's life. But that wasn't the end of the story. Eventually, Cain did die. Because sin does bring death. And we'll see that over and over again. Eventually, everyone died. And eventually, everyone does die. We see that in the cemeteries. The, the fact that people die is proof that God's word is true. That sin brings death. If you take of this fruit, you will surely die. Cain married his sister or other blood relative because that was the only people there back then. And back in those days, um, as I was reading, it said that the genes of Adam and Eve were perfect. Um, the only people here were brothers and sisters of Adam and Eve's children. So that's all they had to marry to multiply and fill the earth. So back in those days, that was okay. And um, the marrying of close relatives didn't bring about gene mutations that cause disease and other things that it does today. And it was later on in the Law of Moses where people were forbidden to marry their close relatives. Genesis 5-4 tells us that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. They had more than just Cain, Abel, and Seth, but they had other sons and daughters. In this chapter of Genesis, we see the first city, which was named Enoch. The first case of polygamy, the beginning of organized animal husbandry, the beginning of art and music, metal crafts, the first song concerning violence and bloodshed. The Bible teaches and archaeologists confirm 
Yeah, that the people before the flood were not mere savages. They were smart. They were intelligent. And they, they built cities. And they did all kinds of things. The, the ability to create is a God-given ability. God did not remove the natural talents of Cain's descendants because of Cain's sin. The civilization formed by Cain's descendants might have been as great as that of Greece or Rome. Natural ability and creativity do not equal godliness. And within a few generations, all of mankind except one man had become depraved. Cain was a restless wanderer on earth. Cain was a restless wanderer on earth until the day that he died. His citizenship wasn't in heaven, nor did he have any hope to reach the heavenly city. The only heaven Cain knew was his city on earth. Regardless of what Satan might try to do, God has a plan, and it will not be thwarted. Nothing we do can stop the plan of God from being accomplished in or through our lives. Isaiah 14, 24 says, Surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as, I, and as I have purposed, so it will happen. Ephesians 1, 11 tells us that God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Genesis 4, 25, Adam and Eve had another son, and his name was Seth. Seth's name means God has granted me another child in the place of Abel since Cain killed him. Seth then had a son and named him Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. So Seth became the godly line through which the Lord Jesus Christ would come from. So we have an ungodly line through the line of Cain and the godly line coming through Seth. And we'll see this all the way through the Bible, the two different peoples. God's promise to Adam and Eve and to all mankind of a coming Savior would be fulfilled, for it was through Seth and his descendants that the Savior would be born. Next week in Genesis 5, we'll be studying the genealogy of Adam all the way up to Noah. What are we going to talk about next week? I don't know, but I will find something that the Lord can use to encourage you through this genealogy. It's always been a neat thing to read and learn and grow and I've been learning so much studying a little bit deeper into all of these chapters of Genesis and, and reading the commentaries and finding different stuff to share with you it's been a blessing to me to learn new things and um, I can't wait to see what I'm going to learn as I study Genesis 5 and, and share it with you next week I hope you have a great week let me just pray for us to close us out Lord we thank you once again for the rich treasures that we find in your word we thank you for the lessons that you teach us, the warnings that you give us, the hope that you give us. Help us to walk in obedience to you, to give our lives to you as living sacrifices that are holy and acceptable in your sight. Help us continue to die to ourselves, our selfish ways, and live our lives to bring you glory. Help us to walk in obedience. I ask you to continue to minister to these ladies throughout the week. Continue to strengthen them and encourage them as they spend time in your word. Help them to know your word, to walk in your ways. And help us to trust you enough to walk in obedience to you, to surrender our lives completely to you. And when we sin and fall short of your glory, which we will do, Father, help us to have quick and repentant hearts. Help us to walk in the power of your spirit, not letting anger and unforgiveness and bitterness come out of our hearts, defiling ourselves and those around us. Help us to have a godly sorrow. Help us to be conscious stricken over the sin in our lives that we hate it the way that you hate it. And help us to turn from sin and run to you. To delight ourselves in you and to seek you above all else. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.